Hello, welcome everyone to another episode of Science Rehashed. I am Mehdi Jurfi, your host. Welcome to this episode of Science Rehashed. I'm Shen Ning, uh, your other host. And today we'll be doing another 360 perspective episode on COVID-19. And this week our topic will be focused on diagnostics of COVID-19. Our first episode on COVID-19 came out in early April, and the landscape of the world and this pandemic is dramatically different these days. At the end of the first episode, doctors Joshua Barakis and Benjamin Linus both touched on the importance of COVID-19 testing to stop the spread of the virus. So this has no doubt become a focal point for health departments, researchers, and physicians, which is why we'll spend today taking a closer look at COVID-19 diagnostics and we'll attempt to answer some of the following questions. What are some of the different types of tests? How accurate are these tests? Why is getting tested increasingly important? How can testing keep communities safe as a country continues to reopen its economy? And what is herd immunity? Before diving into these questions, let's begin by assessing the state of the pandemic domestically and abroad. So please tell us a little bit about what happened in China. Internationally, Beijing, China saw a resurgence of the virus, the origin still largely a mystery, and the Chinese capital had reported over 54 days without local transmission before the June 11th outbreak detection. As the numbers of those testing positive for COVID-19 began to rise, the government responded by reinstating a shutdown in the affected areas of the North West region of the country. And this included Beijing and parts of surrounding provinces. And this partial shutdown has seemingly allowed China to get the potential second wave of the coronavirus under control. By July 1st, outlets have reported that the fast response on behalf of the government and the high rates of testing for active COVID-19 has proved successful for preventing a second wave from exploding. Meanwhile, in Sweden, the country has taken a much different approach from the beginning of the pandemic. Rather than institute a lockdown as China and many other countries, including many parts of the United States, choose to do, Sweden opted for social distancing policies but kept most businesses, including bars and restaurants, open. The intention being to allow enough of the population to gain immunity to coronavirus with the exposure so that the country could have what is considered herd immunity. Herd immunity occurs when a large portion of a community, the herd, becomes immune to a disease, making the spread of disease from person to person unlikely. As a result, the whole community becomes protected, not just those who are immune. But then the question remains what percentage of a community needs to be immune in order to achieve herd immunity? Well, it varies from disease to disease. The more contagious a disease is, the greater the portion of the population that needs to be immune to stop its spread. For example, the measles is a highly contagious disease. It's estimated that 94% of the population must be immune to interrupt the chain of transmission. While the country has not faced a situation similar to Italy's, with devastating consequences of hospital being overwhelmed, many have criticized this approach. In late May, NPR reported that Sweden's mortality rate may be higher than the US, and since that time, a number of studies have came out with research supporting this statement. Additionally, Sweden's immunity hovering around 20% is far from the necessary 60% required for herd immunity. As testing continues to become more available and implemented, scientists around the world will be able to determine whether that percentage of the population reported as having immunity to COVID-19 is higher. 
Regardless, that number is far from herald immunity, as Sweden had hoped when it decided to risk higher mortality rates in favor of speeding up reaching herald immunity. Within the United States, New York and California, two of the coronavirus epicenters at one point, are having different experiences. While California was one of the first states to institute a shelter in place in response to the coronavirus, New York established its shelter in place orders days later, which could have been the key difference in the following weeks. New York is now in phase three of reopening, and according to New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, has effectively flattened the curve. California was also reopening with some bars, salons, restaurants, and movie theaters reopening for indoor business. However, the state has seen a spike in coronavirus cases in July. In response, California Governor Gavin Newsom has walked back some of the allowances and the state is now trying to regain control of the pandemic by further staggering the reopening. And all the while, scientists across the country and the world are figuring out how to get accurate numbers for population immunity and determining which COVID-19 tests are reliable and ready to use. So a diagnostic test can show if you have an active coronavirus infection and should take steps to quarantine yourself or isolate yourself from others. And currently there's two types of diagnostic tests which can detect the virus. One, the molecular test that can detect the virus's genetic material. And then there's also antigen tests that can detect specific proteins on the surface of the virus. The Sabeti lab from the Broad Institute has made some of those breakthroughs by inventing a diagnostic chip. We had to work openly. We had to share and we had to work together. And we have to do that. We all have to demand that of ourselves and others to be open to each other when an outbreak happens, to fight in this fight together. And let us not let the world be defined by the destruction wrought by one virus, but illuminated by billions of hearts and minds working in unity. Thank you. This was the talk given by Dr. Perdis Sabati at Ted Woman in 2015. Dr. Perdis Sabati is a professor at Broward Institute at Harvard and MIT. In this talk titled, How We Will Fight the Next Deadly Virus, Dr. Sabati talked about the battle against Ebola virus. Who would have imagined in 2015 that in five years, the world will be paralyzed by another deadly virus called COVID-19? However, Dr. Sabati predicted one thing right. To fight this battle, scientists all over the world has worked openly and worked together to study how to detect the infection how to treat the infected and how to prevent its spread further. Right before the COVID outbreak, Dr. Sabati's lab designed a chip that accelerates virus detection using very novel CRISPR technology. We will learn today how their discovery can help fight the COVID battle. We spoke with two scientists, Cameron and Sherry from MIT labs. Yeah, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Pardis Sabeti's lab, and I've been spending the past couple of years developing CRISPR-based technologies for detecting and destroying RNA viruses. And uh, in about six months, I'll be starting my own lab at Princeton University. My name is Sherry Ackerman. I've been working as a postdoc in Paul Blaney's lab. He's in the bioengineering department at MIT and work at the Broad Institute. And I actually just wrapped up my postdoc and have now started a company based on some of the technology that I was working on in that lab. Dr. Sabati's lab has been a part of the group in Nigeria who diagnosed first cases of Ebola in Sierra Leone and sequenced virus genetics makeup. How do you compare the Ebola outbreak with current pandemic with regards to trajectory, awareness, and containment of the spread and challenge as well as financial perspective? Really, uh, with Ebola, diagnosis was a lot easier in a certain sense because the symptoms of Ebola are very obvious and the viral titers are extremely high. When someone gets sick with Ebola, you know it. As a result, I think that was one of the reasons why it, it didn't spread quite as far as it did. Although I will say that, that, that we were very lucky with Ebola, as we were with many other previous outbreaks, that there wasn't as much asymptomatic transmission, which is really, I think, what caught the world by surprise a bit earlier this year when we sort of anticipated, well, we're not seeing sick people 
in many countries. And so there was a, cr a crucial window at the end of February, early March, where people didn't really realize that the coronavirus was spreading around the world because it takes a while to see cases come up and, and to see people ultimately start going to the ICU or, or, or having serious symptoms. And so I think that's been the, the challenge with it is, is really we sort of missed our opportunity to contain it to one part of the world. And now that it's everywhere, it, it's created a, a much bigger problem. We know that Dr. Sabati's lab uses the CRISPR technology as a diagnostic and therapeutic tools for a while. Can you briefly explain what is CRISPR and why we're using CRISPR for diagnosis for COVID-19? A brief background on what CRISPR is. So it's a system that bacteria use to defend themselves against invading viruses. And it's, it's really powerful because it allows the bacteria to recognize a specific virus that's invading it. And so we can take those same systems and use them for our own purposes as a way of recognizing particular sequences of interest. And the CRISPR systems that, that exist in nature can you know, detect both DNA and RNA. And in particular, a lot of our recent work has focused on these RNA-targeting CRISPR proteins, mostly Cas13, which we have used in a number of different contexts to both detect nucleic acid as well as to target and cleave viral RNA. So even though the chip was originally designed to allow large-scale tests for hundreds of viruses simultaneously, the Sabeti lab has been able to use the same technology to test the coronavirus. And one of the real powers of Carmen is that it's very flexible. And so you can easily use it uh, to go after different sets of viruses or other pathogens simply by redesigning the CRISPR RNA sequences that you want to use to target the specific viruses of interest as well as the primers that do amplification. And so what we did sort of in response to COVID is, is really a bit of that work. So we made a, a very small panel against six different coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2, but also the original SARS, MERS, and a handful of other human coronaviruses. So what's the advantage of this technology and how does this chip help us prepare for future virus outbreaks? advantages of the technology is that you can put into the device 50 samples, 100 samples, 200 samples at a time. And so really the ideal use case for this technology might not be being in your home where it just needs to be, you know, you testing yourself, but rather being part of a larger lab facility that would allow the throughput of that facility to be much higher. And then the facility would be getting not just the answer to you, do you have COVID or not, but actually what do you have? If you test negative for COVID, it would, it would be really helpful to doctors and to public health officials to know, okay, it's not just that you didn't have COVID, it's that you do have influenza or you do have you know, some other virus. And you know, being able to get all of those answers at the exact same time on hundreds of samples at a time would change the way that we think about making decisions around public health you know, related to viral infections. Imagine if we have a 10-plex or a 20-plex test that tests for all of the respiratory viruses that we know exist. And all of a sudden, we start seeing a group of infections in a specific city where everybody is testing negative for everything on the panel. Well, that's weird. We don't usually see that. We can usually diagnose a respiratory virus infection. Then we know we should be sequencing those samples. We should be looking deeper into what virus is actually making those people sick. Because sequencing, of, especially for novel viruses, is much more expensive than a a test like what we're talking about, like Carmen. And so then we can efficiently deploy resources toward the infections that we actually haven't seen before. And that can allow us to identify the emergence of these novel viruses much faster. As mentioned in Dr. Sabeti's TED Talk, the fruition of this technology would not have been possible without the selfless efforts made by the scientific community. While scientists are already sprinting to develop technologies for the detection of future novel viruses, we need to match the pace of the evolving information of current novel outbreaks with global exchange and access to information, reagents, and genetic materials. 
to start the very first experiment on the research and development of novel diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines, scientists rely on the DNA sequence of viral molecules. The more information that is generated, the more demand for the genes that encode that toxic viral building block. To study these genes, researchers make use of a standard tool called plasmids. For this, we spoke with Joanne Caymans from AdGene. So chromosomes are long and complicated and many, many genes on a chromosome. So when a scientist wants to study one gene, they might want to isolate that from the very long, complicated chromosome. And so they take that one gene, which is a linear sequence of DNA, and they put it on a, a small piece of DNA, which is three to four orders of magnitude smaller than a chromosome. So three to four orders of magnitude less complicated, if you will. And those, those little circles of DNA are the toolbox of molecular biology. So if you want to do genome engineering, or let's say you want to study one protein in the COVID-19 disease-causing virus, if you wanted to just study one part of it, you might put it in a plasmid and it would make it easier for you to study in different organisms and in different systems, mutated, normal, fuse it to things so that it's visible in the cell, things that glow. That's what plasmids do. They're the, Again, they're like a toolbox. Now imagine you have this COVID-19 related gene that you want to study and it's sitting in another scientist's freezer. You'll have to first contact them and have them ship it to you, which may take days to reach you without guaranteeing its quality or accuracy. By then, you'll have wasted everyone's time, money, and resources. And it not only frustrates you as a scientist, but also immensely affects scientific progress. So it's actually even worse than you make it out to be. It might take days or weeks. It might really take months if you ever send it. And the thing that you get might be wrong because the tube that you pulled from the freezer was incorrect. Also, you might be in Brazil and I might be in Australia and shipping materials to South America is actually very difficult. To avoid such frustrating scenarios, biological resource centers like AdGene are crucial middlemen between the scientists and organizations, labs, and industries across the world by storing and supplying plasmids quickly and reliably. And now you're hearing from Dr. Joanne Caymans, who is the executive director of AdGene. AdGene is a nonprofit that's mission is to help scientists share. Now AdGene is probably the worldwide premier organization in sharing physical materials between laboratories. And AdGene doesn't own the materials in the repository, in the collection. We are a broker to help people move things easily between countries around the world. And before the pandemic, we were distributing almost 800 items each day. So it's not a small venture. You know, we, we've distributed almost one and a half million materials for other scientists. So we have 80,000 different plasmids in the collection made by scientists in their laboratories. We don't distribute any commercial materials, only things that have been modified by scientists. How is AdGene meeting the needs of COVID-19 related plasmid exchange across many labs? So what AdGene does is we have that plasmid already deposited in the repository. It's quality controlled. It's fully sequenced. So we know exactly what it is. It's barcoded. So we don't make very many mistakes. You can be assured that the sequence on the website is what you get in the tube and you can get it without any delay. So it has accelerated research tremendously because the scientists studying COVID-19 related viruses, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, other coronaviruses, they deposited with AdGene very quickly. They understood the need for these materials and really stepped up to the plate, if you'll excuse the, the expression. They, they came forward and said, we know AdGene needs to have these right away because we need to get them out to the world as quickly as possible. So far, we've distributed almost 6,000 COVID-19 related materials in the last eight weeks or so. I, I think this is fascinating. Global information sharing and accessing like genetics, uh, genetic sequences, reagent, and even like data within research community uh, has gained importance more than ever in this pandemic, where knowledge on virus is really evolving on a daily basis. The pace of science is extraordinary. The things that people are depositing is really, it's unfathomable almost how quickly the scientific community has just gone. And labs that weren't working on COVID-19 or working, working on coronaviruses but had knowledge of this area completely pivoted the work they were doing. We've shipped to 53 different countries just COVID-19 
Many plasmids could be used in COVID-19 research that are not directly related to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but those are ones that we have deemed specific to the virus. By the way, I, I want to say many universities have stepped up as well, and some labs have been incredibly productive in creating materials quickly. Within days, it's just yes. incredible. And many of those scientists called us and said, we're sending them, they're open, everyone should get them, industry, academia, get them out. And and these materials are, are rapidly moving. So for example, the ACE2 receptor, which is the protein that is thought to be probably the primary receptor for the SARS-CoV-2, you know, we've already sent that to uh, over 300 laboratories, just that one plasma, wow. right? You know, wow. and spike protein from SARS hundreds of times has already gone out. And are these plasmids available freely or at lower cost? They're available at a pretty low cost. So it's $75 a plasmid. In addition, Agene is able to ship things to people that can't afford it if they reach out to us and let us know that they can't afford to pay that fee. So specifically in non-industrialized countries, we frequently get those requests and we're happy to be able to fulfill them. We want materials to flow very freely. And the idea is to make them available to everyone. Agene's mission is to help everyone share. And so one of the reasons for making these materials accessible, the intellectual materials is for people in, in non-industrialized countries where science is harder to do with fewer resources. Indeed, this is a very noble mission that everyone needs right now. Speedy sharing should not compromise the authenticity of the plasma being shared. So in a such a fast-paced environment where you have a lot of incoming plasmids and the demand for supply, how does Adgene keep up with the high quality standards? We're, we're balancing keeping costs down as we make things available. We can't be free. We do an enormous amount of service at education, quality control, intake, distribution, shipping, export. We have a whole staff, so it can't be free. Sometimes we get calls from people and they're like, why isn't it free? Why don't you just have a bench in a lab? You know, we have 90 employees. It's a major operation. We're very, very professional about it. So every sample is barcoded from the minute you send it to us through the deposit process all the way through to the final tube that is used for distribution. Even as the samples go into the shipping box, they're scanned by barcoding. Everything is stored in either a paper barcode in a label or a 2D barcoded tube. So if we do make a mistake, we'll always make good on it. We have a fantastic customer service team, but we don't make very many mistakes because of our, our staff is just really careful and in what they do. And occasionally something's deposited that isn't what it's supposed to be, and we work with the depositors to make sure that what we put online, we know what it is as best we can. And how much time does it take typically uh, after the new either COVID-19 related plasmid or other other genes is deposited to being available for distribution? Yeah, the ad gene is really are working so hard to get like high priority COVID-19 deposits right now. You know, it takes us anywhere usually from four to five weeks. They've been bringing out some of these materials in less than three weeks from getting the plasmid, transforming it, doing quality control, creating stocks, making sure the data are correct, and then publishing it, sometimes even faster. So we have a quality control process that involves a technology called Plexwell from the company Sequel. It's a next-gen sequencing platform that is particularly suited for plasmids and small DNA, not, not genomic DNA. And uh, that takes a little bit of time to go through that process and the analysis, of course. So we do it as fast as we can. And you probably prioritized COVID-19 related plasmid sharing in the, in the past few months. Has it affected the resources you provide for other research? Not too much. Our software team kicked into gear and our product team and started making modifications in our inventory management system so that we could immediately flag people who were depositing or requesting COVID-19 related materials. And so those things are definitely getting more attention and moving faster, but we've been able to keep enough staff on site that other requests are not being ignored. Deposits are coming in, materials are turning around, and we're getting parts of the world that have been open for a while, like Asia, Korea, China, have been doing norm, almost normal levels of ordering for some weeks now. So both COVID-19 related materials and other materials as well. So can you talk about your partnership with Ginkgo Bioworks and how it will help to leverage the, the, the COVID-19 research? 
I, I will, full disclosure, one of Agene's founders works at Ginkgo. One of his founders is still at Agene as well. So we're, it's a close partnership and they're very entrepreneurial and innovative. They're the founders of Agene. They're, they're always thinking about innovation and they immediately rose to the charge. Uh, we had to close the company for a couple of weeks while we figured out how we would work under the pandemic situation, but we were only closed for about two weeks. And right at that time, they started thinking about, we need to speed up this research. It needs to be fast, fast. The world is suffering. How can we do that? And Ginkgo is an enormous foundry. It's a synthetic biology company. I, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They do amazing synthetic biology projects, the forefront of, of gene synthesis and, and, and organism synthesis, if you will. So they right away said, let's take the foundry, you know, it's some factory, essentially, let's take the foundry and let's make plasmids that scientists need. We can guess what things that they'll need to study this virus well, based on past research and what's popular in the scientific community. And we'll just start making stuff that's open, no restrictions. Anyone can get it. They sign paperwork through Agene, but it's for record keeping purposes. It's through the an open MTA, but there's no restrictions on use for these materials. They're fully open. And so they just started powering up their machines and powering through the synthesis, uh, design and synthesis, automated and rapid. And Agene, as quickly as they could make the plasmids, we're getting them on site sequencing them and getting them out to the community. The company Ginkgo Bioworks synthesized an enormous collection. They're in the process of synthesizing thousands of plasmids from the SARS-CoV-2 genome, genes fused for expression in different organisms and with different tags and different fusions. So again, essentially a, a COVID-19 toolbox for many, many purposes. And they've been synthesizing those and they're open to both academic and industry requesters. So people in universities and people in companies. It's a completely open collection. We're getting those online as fast as we can. So they come in, we quality them and we get them online. And we've already distributed dozens of those to the community. And I'm sure it will be more as more things are going online with the collection. This is outstanding. Other than being a plasmid repository, Adgene has been a crucial educational resource to many scientists. What are your efforts to provide educational resources for scientists studying coronavirus and other scientists? Because we're so central to the community, so many people work with us, they're often happy to, you know, we're not where papers are published, but if there are tips and tricks and things that maybe don't make it into the paper, protocols perhaps, information sharing through our blog where some of our depositors write blogs in order to quickly get information out about what's new and what's coming from their laboratories so, or from so there, there, there is a resource page uh, that yep, scientists yep. can go in and get yep, there's a, Yep, there's a resource page that links to all of our protocols, information, searchable tables of all the materials so that you can find what you're looking for. We also have a number of blogs already on COVID-19, but of course, on any topic in molecular biology, you can search or careers, science careers as well. You can search the blog. Our genies love to provide this material, as does the community. So um, it's really crowdsourced backroom knowledge, all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes with tools in molecular biology. We have an enormous amount of traffic of people coming just to learn our YouTube videos, our blogs, our protocols, and we're constantly serving that material from depositors and from the Adgenie scientists themselves. They're super interested in making that available. I have to applaud you for the work you are doing. I can't imagine the current scenario of rapid sharing of reagents and plasmids without organizations like Adgene. Effort from bench scientists and support from nonprofit organizations have made it possible for the development of hundreds and thousands of diagnostic tools since the outbreak of COVID. So how do we narrow all those options down and pick the best candidate to be used in the clinic? My name is Rushdi Ahmed, and I am a staff scientist at the VIS Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard University. And prior to that, I was at the Broad Institute for about 12 years. Why are diagnostic testing tools essential for fighting the coronavirus? Things are moving so fast and fluidly that 10 weeks ago, the picture was quite different, you can imagine. So at that time, and still is, there's an urgent need for testing. Test, test, test. So that, that was our prime directive is to 
come up with a set of tests, particularly for our group, was direct to consumer, so tests that could be used at home or at workplace, because the goal was not to burden the healthcare system, particularly healthcare workers. So you can imagine if people who have symptoms can get their testing done at home, then they don't have to go to the hospitals or clinics and burden the healthcare system. So that's uh, that was an urgent need then and is an urgent need, of course, right now. Now, of course, as the economy opens up, we need to have a sensible, systematic approach of getting people safely to work and keeping them healthy. And as we know, up to 50 to 70 percent of those who are positive are asymptomatic for quite a while. And in fact, they have the highest viral load right before they present symptoms, so they could be spreading without even knowing it. Therefore, one of our goals to keep a workplace safe and our home safe is to have enough abundant testing. So it all starts there if we could test them at home or at workplace. And it doesn't exist because the FDA hasn't yet provided authorization for any of these tests to be used at home or at work. It has to be supervised. So one of our goals is to validate clinically the direct-to-consumer test that we've identified in our labs with samples that we've acquired under this program. And then hopefully in a way, convince the FDA, because FDA has to weigh in at the end whether this can be used at home. So get enough evidence that it can be safely used at home, because it doesn't make sense to use them at home if it's not providing accurate information. As you can imagine, there's all types of age groups at home, and not everybody might be able to use them properly. So that, that's the hurdle that we have to cross. Dr. Ahmed, I had the privilege to be part of the COVID Innovation Center and working with you directly. I know that there were thousands of tests available through the diagnostic testing. Could you walk us through the criteria that uh, shortlisting the potential promising direct-to-consumer candidates that they are going for the validation and the final list? Uh, so when we started, as you said, there were you know thousands of them out there. And what we did was First of all, define the specification of what the direct-to-consumer product could be. For example, is sensitivity, specificity, whether these manufacturers have enough capacity. So all those things had to be figured out. And Dr. Jarfi, you yourself was, were part of the specification group. So once that specification was set by doing a service of clinicians and getting their input, that was done very quickly. We, in parallel, started doing our, what we call, deep horizon scanning, basically look at the universe and see what products are out there as reported by the manufacturers. And what we did is then match them against our specifications, do the triage, have a, have a number of heuristic scoring algorithms to down-select to around 100 or so. And then that got further down-selected to right now on our website, we have about 65 or so candidates. And of those, 20 of them have been acquired. As of today, nine have, have already been delivered to our labs and they have already started testing. So that was the process of systematically triaging a large list and coming down with a handful of viable products that have a chance of going to consumers in the end. Besides diagnostic testing, another test that has dominated the news headlines are serological tests. A serological test is an antibody test that looks for the antibodies that are made by your immune system in response to a threat, such as the coronavirus. Antibodies can help fight infections. It can take several days or weeks to develop after you have had an infection and may stay in your system for several weeks or more after recovery. Because of this, antibody tests should not be used to diagnose a active coronavirus infection. So at this time, researchers do not know if the presence of antibodies necessarily means that you're immune to the coronavirus. The serology test is needed to determine whether a person has already been infected. And it could also tell you if you have been infected, because once we are infected by any pathogen, our body mounts an immune response. And in this case, what we're looking for are these molecules called IgG and IgM. And they give us a sense, if we can detect them, that we have been infected and our body has mounted an immune response. And that is measured in blood. So these tests are our blood tests. Recent studies have also found that many people with mild or no symptoms who tested positive for COVID-19 later don't show antibodies when tested again. 
Patients with mild symptoms produce a weaker antibody response than those who get more severely ill. Most antibody tests are primed to minimize false positives, but as a result are less sensitive. So how effective are antibodies against the COVID-19 and how long can it last? Most recent data here, it's showing with COVID-19 that there is some immunity, but again, more studies are needed to see how long lasting it is. It's only been six months. So yes, uh, that is still an unknown in terms of the immune status. But one thing we do know that if you do have it, we know that you have you had it and you've survived it. So maybe if you could get again reinfected, again, we don't know, maybe you won't if it's strong enough, that you would have a better chance of fighting it than maybe someone who hasn't been infected. Since vaccines are not currently available and may not be a one-for-all solution for preventing COVID, what are some other options of avoiding and preventing COVID? We've heard from NIAID, N-I-A-I-D at NIH, Dr. Fauci mentioned, you know, it the three T's, right? Testing, tracing, and treatment. So without tracing, it's extremely difficult to contain and prevent the virus. So under the Magellan Brigham COVID Innovation Center, we do have a group called the Data Analytics, and underneath that, there's an M Health mobile health group, and they've been looking at all types of contact tracing applications. And as you mentioned, Dr. Geoffrey, that it's extremely important to understand the privacy and security concerns. So one country that has done this extremely well is in China. There they have an app. Everyone has to have the app, every single person, and it's centrally managed. So if someone came in contact with someone and you find out that, you know, four days ago you had this contact, then you can trace that person down and you can isolate everyone because everything is recorded on the app. Now, that type of an intervention most likely will not happen in the U.S., but you could imagine doing it in a hospital setting where everyone within a hospital wears some sort of has this app and they could be traced within the hospital setting. But at a societal level, I doubt that something like that w- would happen anywhere outside of, you know, uh, maybe China. I'm aware that you have been talking and having a discussion with a lot of local scientists, doctors and clinicians, epidemiologists, as well as the FDA people. What are the top concerns for reopening the country? The top concerns, of course, is this resurgence, right? This spike. I mean, if you really think about it, nothing has changed. The virus is still out there. You know, there is no vaccine yet. We don't have herd immunity, where it's like 70, 80 percent have not been infected. So the real concern is that since we've been locked up for so long and in the U.S., the weather is getting nicer and people want to go out and, of course, get the economy going because uh, there's been uh, 40 million or so job losses. So the concern, real concern is that it comes back again. And the serious concern is the resurgence in the winter's time when now you will have the double whammy of the flu and COVID-19. So in order to prevent that, we everyone needs to wear a mask. That's for sure if you're out and practice all this proper hygiene and maintain uh, six feet to even lo- you know, more of a distance. So that's the only way we can uh, survive this and not have another resurgence. So the fear is a resurgence of this. We are reopening, but the virus is still out there and slowing the spread of the disease is in our hands. So we should wash our hands, wear masks and maintain the minimum six feet distance and, of course, cough in your elbows. And we can contribute to the painstakingly global effort of scientists from labs like Sherry and Cameron, public health officials, hospitals, resource centers like Adgene, who have come together for one mission of curbing out COVID-19. One such brilliant collaboration, which is now transforming the face of diagnostic testing for COVID, is a company, Sherlock Biosciences. This is a 20-person company that has had to work like a 5,000-person company in this pandemic. Sherlock Biosciences was found in 2019 to develop rapid, easy, affordable, and accessible diagnostic tests for infectious diseases using the CRISPR technology that Sherry and Cameron mentioned before. And within a year of its establishment, it received a FDA approval for CRISPR-based COVID-19 tests called Sherlock under emergency use authorization. So Sherlock, the acronym, describes our CRISPR-based platform, and it stands for specific high sensitivity enzymatic reporter unlocking. We were quite pleased to see that we had 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. 
This is Rahul Danda, the CEO, President and Co-Founder of Sherlock Biosciences, who has been in the field of diagnostics for over 20 years. Uh, Rahul, congratulations to you and your outstanding team for being the first ever group to receive the FDA authorization for a CRISPR-based diagnostic test. So this development is also unique in that the first FDA-approved application of CRISPR is not for gene editing or for therapeutic use, but for a diagnostic purpose. Could you please tell us a little bit about this diagnostic test? So the test itself is CRISPR-based, as, as you point out. CRISPR, as many know, is clustered regularly and interspersed short palindromic repeats. It's a method that has been really highlighted for the simplicity it has for gene editing and therapeutics for certain. I think what, what has been really valuable to us is that that same robustness that makes it very exciting for therapeutics, that ability to you know cut, copy, and paste in gene sequences, is also an incredibly powerful diagnostic tool. And so the tool that we have, we're launching as a, as a kit, is a very sensitive diagnostic system that can identify COVID, or really the SARS-CoV-2 virus, in, in a faster and, and simpler way than I think is being done today through most molecular methods. So it works fairly straightforward. The RNA virus is copied, and then we use CRISPR to seek out the sequence and the guide RNA that attaches to the CRISPR molecule will hybridize to the sequence if it is there, activate the CRISPR molecule, and that molecule will then go through a process that generates a fluorescent signal. So it's a fairly robust way to sensitively and specifically identify the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And what we're really pleased about is that it's you know approximately an hour, which shaves off quite a bit of time for what are currently four to six hour tests and sometimes even longer. The actual technology is a genetic target though. So it's a molecular test. So it's not an antigen or antibody test. It's identifying the RNA sequence of the virus. So if the sample glows, the virus is present and the RNA of this virus can be detected from patient samples taken from the nasal, mouth or throat swabs or fluids from the lung called bronchoalveolar lavage. Americans rely on the FDA to evaluate the safety and efficiency of diagnostics, drugs, and medical devices before they get approved for public use. These may take years. However, during a public health emergency, when there are no sufficient alternatives and evidence available to receive full FDA approval, it quickly evaluates new solutions. It can allow the use of unapproved medical products to diagnose, treat, or prevent public health threats like COVID-19 or past outbreaks. And I know that within a matter of three months, Sherlock received FDA authorization under the EUA, which stands for the Emergency Use Authorization. Looking into the future, and this is not the first pandemic and this is not the last one, we need to be prepared. Can you briefly explain what EUA is and how it benefits in any outbreak in the future? The emergency use authorization process that the Federal Drug Administration has put together is something that is meant to be a rapid response to any public health threat where innovation is required. It's, it's a fantastic initiative that allows very, very innovative technologies to progress to the point of product to make an impact. And the way that they did it for COVID and that I anticipate the FDA will do it for other outbreaks, which, you know, let's hope don't happen, but we should be prepared for. They set aside a very specific protocol that approximated with some confidence all of the very extensive studies that normally would take years and created proxies for that in terms of the methods that are used to validate the test. And so they put out a very, very comprehensive guidance on how it is one can pursue testing to prove the test is valid. 
What they also did that many don't hear about is they made themselves incredibly available at the FDA for any inquiry. And we experienced a, a less than 24 hour turnaround time for any inquiry we sent their way. And so we felt as we went through our FDA validation studies for the emergency use authorization that they were a partner. They helped us answer questions that were coming up as we were planning our work. They guided us towards the most effective way to generate data. And and I expect that that will be maintained in any of these similar scenarios that may occur in the future. Indeed, that is incredible. And the next important point that I wanted to discuss here is that the development of a diagnostic test is only a part of the testing challenge. Scaling up its production and distribution is another challenge. And we asked Rahul about Sherlock's plan of setting up the required infrastructure to make this test possible. So you're hitting on, I think, one of the most important and overlooked parts of product development. One of, one of the incredibly valuable things of, of the CRISPR platform is that it is very robust and programmable. And so when we talk about pandemic response, having something that could be easily developed into a test is at the core of our ability to respond. However, if you don't have the infrastructure there to make that test scaled for manufacturing availability, then you're, you're wondering whether you heard the tree fall in the forest. And so we really do need to do those things. And as a company like Sherlock, or a company of Sherlock's size, and in our stage of development, which was less than a year old when we took this project on, it wasn't something where we were going to scale manufacturing. When I think about the amazing accomplishments that the team made, the technology is the one that's most obvious to identify. But simultaneously with running all of those studies, we had an an entirely different team setting up the partnerships necessary for us to be able to not just scale the manufacturing, but also supply the materials. And so in tandem, we had to create an infrastructure as if we were you know, a couple hundred million dollar company as opposed to the 20 people that we were. And so we very quickly brought on board the experts we needed either in full-time or consulting capacity to close that gap. And one of the most important connections we made was with a company called IDT or Integrated DNA Technologies. It's an Idaho-based company that had just previously made an incredible impact on the pandemic by scaling up to 5 million tests a week for the RT-PCR that the CDC had identified as the necessary protocol in the absence of any new authorized tests that could be used. So IDT had all of the infrastructure necessary for molecular tests, but also they have unique capabilities in generating CRISPR molecules, the molecules that we use for the detection of of these targets. So we had spent as much time with them streamlining the process for manufacturability and, and launch as we did on the FDA studies and the scientific validation. And had we not done that, I think that we would not be in a position to really answer the first problem that we identified in the pandemic, which is how do you create greater capacity? And the answer to that is not just the number of tests, but also how do you use a different set of instruments and reagents so that supply chains aren't constricted? And while there's overlap between these tests and other molecular tests, there's also divergences that actually create an ease of access to the technology. And so I think that we were in a very fortunate position to find a very strong partner with the scalability that IDT had. I think we were were in a good position with the team we had assembled to really knock down each of the barriers that were between us and a product. And I think one of the partners we have to identify that is is the FDA who created a structure that made it very clear on how we could do that. And so in the end, to be successful, we needed to be more than just a technology company. We needed to, to be a fully operating commercial company. And we had to assemble that in the same amount of time that we were running these studies. And the only way that a 20-person company can appear to be a you know 
5,000 person company is to create the right network of partners who can play their strengths to where we did not have them. And uh, we're fortunate that those strengths are the best in the business. That's really impressive. So Rahul, now the economy is reopening. People are going to offices, restaurants, schools. I'm concerned if I'm exposing the community with the COVID-19 virus, or if I'm getting exposed to it at some point. I'm not doing tests every time I step out of the house and clearly I could be asymptomatic. With respect to accessibility, how can Sherlock Biosciences facilitate the reopening of the economy? Great question. There's, there's actually a lot to cover in that, in that question. I think it's all very important. So, so there's a couple things that I think we, we need to do, and, and I think that we're acting on as many, if not all of these, as possible. So in terms of this first product, it's, a, it's more of a high-throughput test. I think you know, when we first saw the pandemic break out, one of the issues we saw as a nation and as a, as a global healthcare system was that access to testing was limited. And higher capacity for testing seemed to be the immediate need. And so we launched this product to satisfy that need. I think as now we, we worry about how we stimulate the economy, how we get people back to work and life back to normal, we're thinking beyond just testing the symptomatic patients, how do we monitor the existing population? And there are two things that that are driving that from a technological perspective. One is molecular tests like ours. The other are antibody tests that determine whether you've had exposure, where there's a lot of great research in companies trying to develop those rapidly, and many that have done so. I think where this new dimension of this pandemic is being added to the diagnostic landscape is the setting for the test. And so as we think about being able to reopen everything to the scale that we want before a vaccine is present, I think things change when there's a vaccine. But while we work towards managing the pandemic at a time of active viral spread, the things that we need to do are decentralized testing. The first step on getting to full decentralization is placing these instruments and cartridge-based tests for rapid turnaround time in easily accessible locations or in high-risk locations like long-term care facilities or on the easier accessibility side, pharmacies and grocery stores, urgent care. But, But I think to really drive towards full management, what we want are at home simple tests. And you know what Sherlock does have as well beyond our CRISPR platform is the synthetic biology platform. And this synthetic biology platform uses cell-free systems to identify nucleic acid sequences, RNA or DNA in an instrument-free way. Now we think we can also deploy CRISPR this way, but there would be some instrumentation involved. And so the more rapid path for us to get towards the solution to the pandemic is to take our synthetic biology platform and drive that towards a COVID solution. And so we feel at Sherlock, even as an earlier stage company, we do have the mature technologies, and, and and I stress technologies because we need more than one, to identify the virus in patients who may be in a high throughput location like the hospital, a more decentralized location like the grocery store, or to really manage the spread of disease and keep people home and away from others to spread towards we can do that within the home. And the good news is that Sherlock Biosciences announced their partnership with BinX Health to make CRISPR-based COVID-19 diagnostic tests available at decentralized settings without the need for additional instrumentation. This would make on-the-spot decision-making possible for COVID-19. Today, we followed several stories on the diagnostic developments occurring rapidly in response to COVID-19. The scientific community is having remarkable levels of collaboration across industry, universities, and borders, with organizations dropping projects to devote their 
resources, and knowledge to speed up the innovation and distribution process. Even with the incredible volume and breadth of scientific effort through viral testing chips, efficient international distribution of viral genomic sequences, and FDA emergency authorization, the problems fighting the coronavirus at every stage of reopening persists. Even as testing becomes more available across the U.S., getting communities tested at the scale necessary for meaningful preventive spread remains an issue. As mentioned previously, home testing will be an important next step as it will lessen the load on medical staff in supervising swabbing and sample collection. A looming question in diagnostics is whether testing positive for the antibody for coronavirus will confer immunity long-term. As our understanding continues to evolve, it is valuable for us to remain open to change and flexible thinking of how individuals and communities can take steps to combat the virus. For now, we urge our listeners to continue wearing masks, practicing heightened hygiene practices, social distancing, and staying informed. At the beginning of the pandemic, testing supplies are so limited that it was only possible to test highly ill individuals. Now, many cities have testing available upon request. You don't even need the test to be ordered by a physician. If somewhere by where you live has antibody testing capabilities, then we urge you to seek this out. Increasing our understanding of what herd immunity implies for a population will really help us determine the strategies for reopening and the focus for future scientific efforts. Diagnostic are and will continue to be one of the central focuses of managing coronavirus pandemic. But the effects of the virus are in every aspect of our lives and the importance of mental health and understanding the psychological impacts of it are also key to our management strategies. In our next COVID-360 episode, we will be hearing from several mental health experts about what they see as the largest issues for individuals and how we can take care of ourselves as we reach the six month mark of sheltering in place and handling the economic fallout from the shutdown. We hope you will join us for the upcoming episode. Thank you for tuning into today's episode. Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Science Rehashed. Thank you to Dr. Rudy Tenzi for providing us with the music for our intro. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. You can also visit our website at sciencerehash.com. We would also like to thank all the members of Science Rehash who contributed their time in making Science Rehash possible. This includes our writers, Madura Lolikar and Kara Brenner, our marketing director, Carla Diavanzo, our sound editors, Tavi Pollard, Jared Warsaw, and Sophia Nastri, our assistant, Rebecca Solison, our creative director, Emma Brand, our producer, Shuang Zhang, and our business development director, Vichy Lo. Our show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Please subscribe and recommend our podcast to your friends, and send us your comments and feedback. Thanks for listening.